Okay, shalom everyone and welcome to another Thursday night psalm study. We are on Psalm 143 and this is part one, so you're getting my commentary on the on this psalm. And I titled the psalm for this, the study for this week, The Lord's Righteousness Brings Our Soul Out of Trouble. Okay, so before we begin, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for such a wonderful time that we could come together and we can study your word, Lord, as we do study your word. We ask that you would bless our hearts, that you would you would touch our hearts, Lord, and help us to have a desire to apply your word to our lives for your glory, Lord. And we ask that um, all those who are in need, that you would uh, be with them and you would heal those who are sick, Lord. And we just ask all this stuff, these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Okay, so Psalm 143. Let's read through the Psalms. We'll go down to page two of the study. And it says the following. It says, Hear, O Lord, give ear to my supplications. Answer me in your faithfulness, in your righteousness, and do not enter into judgment with your servant. For in your sight no man living is righteous. <coughs> for the enemy has persecuted my soul, he has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me dwell in dark places like those who have long been dead. Therefore, my spirit is overwhelmed within me. My heart is appalled within me. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your doings. I muse on the work of your hands. I stretch out my hands to you. My soul longs for you as a parched land. Answer me quickly, O Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me. For I will become like those who go down to the pit. Let me hear your loving kindness in the morning. For I trust in you. Teach me the way in which I should walk. For to you I lift up my soul. Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. I will take refuge in you. Teach me to do your will. For you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. For the sake of your name, O Lord, revive me. In your righteousness, bring my soul out of trouble, and in your loving kindness, cut off my enemies and destroy all those who afflict my soul, for I am your servant. Okay, so, so that was Psalm 143. There were 12 verses. So in this week's study from Psalm 143, the psalm opens in verses 1 and 2, and it says, Hear my prayer, O Lord, give ear to my supplications. Answer me in your faithfulness, in your righteousness. And do not enter into judgment with your servant, for in your sight no man living is righteous. So here, while I was reading these, these scriptures, uh, we find um, an ancient insight into the understanding that no man is righteous before the Lord God Almighty. David seeks the Lord's mercy to forgive, because no matter how good he is, he always falls short of the righteousness of God. These scriptures also tell us how David believes in the faithfulness of God to his people and specifically to himself. We know, according to God's word, that he is faithful to his promises and to us. Now, David realized this having studied God's Torah and relying upon his word. The Father's faithfulness is intrinsically part of who he is. And throughout the history of Israel, we can see how the Lord has remained faithful to his people even in the midst of their sin. The Torah states in Numbers 23, verse 19, it says, God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? And this reveals to us how the Lord is not like a man who has the tendency to make mistakes, to lie, or to change his mind. It is in this way that our trust in the Lord and his faithfulness is established. The Lord does not experience weakness or being tired, making mix mistakes or temptation. He is faithful when we struggle in these things each day. The Apostle Paul pleaded with the Lord to take away the thorn in his side. The Lord answered his prayer saying that my grace is sufficient for you for power is perfect or perfected in weakness. Paul then states in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9, he says, most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Now note how 
Paul turns his weakness into a way to glorify the Lord God and his Messiah, Yeshua. Weakness is a strength when faith is involved. Note how Paul does not doubt or cast doubt on God's ability to heal. The Lord reveals his faithfulness in the midst of our weakness. And when struggling with a temptation, it's easy to think that our struggle is unique, one of, of which nobody else has gone through. And at this point, one may isolate himself and draw away from the Lord. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13, he says that no temptation has overcome, overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. And when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So the Lord provides a way for us even when we feel there is no way out from temptation. The Torah reveals to us how the Lord had this in mind, to provide a way for us to receive forgiveness of sins. And this is the point of the Mishkan in the tabernacle coming from the Lord, confessing our sins, atonement, and intercession on our behalf, which is a priesthood. And this is what the Lord promised to us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and purify us, us from all unrighteousness. And John wrote that in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. So we trust the word of the Lord that he is faithful to forgive. Now the rabbis translate the Targum, the Aramaic Targum. They say, A praise for David, O Lord, hear my prayer, listen to my supplication. In your truth, answer me in your generosity. Now, the translation has David asking for an answer to his prayer in God's generosity. Now, the Targum here, it writes, bet, uh, it says, bet tzedak te, um, bet tzedak techa, meaning, in your righteousness. Now, in the Lord's righteousness, he saves his people and he answers our prayers. The reality of these facts are found in the Lord God, our Father in heaven, sending his only son, Yeshua, to pay for our sins. Now, in the name of Yeshua, the salvation of God, of, of God the Lord, forgives. The Lord is faithful when we are weak, and it is at this point that we are to go, through, go before the Lord with a humble spirit, and he will forgive us and cleanse us. We can experience God's faithfulness. We receive this by believing in his son, Yeshua the Messiah. And for examples of God's faithfulness to keep his covenant with his people may be found throughout the scriptures. You know, for example, Noah, he saved Noah and, and his family. God saved Noah and his family in Genesis chapter 6 and chapter 9. To, to Moshe, it says God, that's, God spared the Israelites when they obeyed in Exodus 19. To Jacob, the Lord God reaffirmed his everlasting covenant to Israel. And we read that in Psalm 105, verse 10. There are dozens of scriptures of God's faithfulness to his people. One of the most significant aspects of God's faithfulness is his forgiveness of our sins. The Lord seeks for our repentance and desire to draw near to him. He provides us a way to seek and to draw near and to receive forgiveness. The promise of the coming Messiah is found within his faithful promise to send a Redeemer. Yeshua to make atonement for our sins where the Lord God in heaven is faithful to forgive if we believe in Yeshua and repent of our sins. We read, it says that the Lord God had sent his son in Matthew chapter 1, that through him we have everlasting life. Christ died for our atonement of sin in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. The Lord God's promise is to remove our sins, Romans 11. The Lord God established Yeshua as the author of eternal salvation in Hebrews chapter 5. And the Lord God cast our sins into the depths of the sea, never to be remembered again in Micah chapter 7. So the faithfulness of God is such that anyone who seeks him will find him. Both faith and faithfulness are a gift. And as we apply our faith, being faithful, we begin to realize more and more God's faithfulness to us. And note that it is the Lord God working in our lives to bear the fruit of the Spirit. And if we are not bearing his testimonies according to the Torah, we should ask ourselves whether we truly believe what we say that we believe. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, it says, God, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, 
Yeshua, the Messiah, our Lord, is faithful. In Second Corinthians, or sorry, in First Corinthians ten, verse thirteen, it says, "No temptation has seized you except what is common to man." And God is faithful; He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. And in Second Thessalonians three, verse three. It says the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. Now in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, we're told that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now based upon these words, we have confidence the Lord God will forgive us and deliver us from our enemies just as David believes with confidence the Lord will forgive and deliver him. Now David speaks of the enemy, of what the enemy is doing. And he says in verses 3 through 5, he says, For the enemy has persecuted my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me dwell in dark places like those who have long been dead. Therefore my spirit is overwhelmed within me. My heart is appalled within me. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your doings. I muse on the work of your hands. So, what David is essentially saying here is that our memory is vital in our relying upon and trusting in the Lord. If we are not in the Word of God on a daily basis, we will not be able to discern between what is right and what is wrong, and between righteousness and unrighteousness. David said that because his enemies crush his life, his spirit is overwhelmed. Now in today's world, to be overwhelmed may be the result of taking on too much work or responsibilities that lead to being out of control. Another aspect of becoming overwhelmed may be due to illness or trauma. One may also feel that there is too much to do and too little time to do it because of our, because of like for example our job or school, time needing to be spent with friends or family, you know, etc. Now in the scriptures, when Yeshua felt overwhelmed, he often went away by himself to get away from the crowds, like we read in Mark chapter 1. And at other times, he went away with his disciples. But there were also times when he was so busy that they didn't even have time to eat. And Yeshua said to his disciples, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest in Mark chapter 6. Now Yeshua drew away from the crowds in order to draw near to the Lord in heaven. And at Gethsemane, Yeshua felt overwhelmed in spirit and soul as it says that he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Yeshua said to his disciples, stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed. David also dealt with the feeling of being overwhelmed. David's model for overcoming this was with prayer and then remembering the past goodness of God and even during prayer, he recalled the goodness of God and his promises. Yeshua did the same. He prayed and solicited the help of friends to pray for him and for support and encouragement. The Lord is faithful to hear and take action to help us. And when we feel overwhelmed, we pray for peace. David said that God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear Though the earth give way and the mountains fall in the heart, into the heart of the sea, in Psalm 46. Our God is a God of peace. And his peace can, we can ask for at any time, having faith that he will answer our prayer. Now the scriptures speak of the Lord giving us good things in Matthew 7. And this is why David remembers the Lord. And this is how David, I, I also believe, uh, remembers the Lord and his deeds in the psalm. When he said in Psalm 143, verse 5, I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your doings. I muse on the work of your hands. David remembers and strengthens his faith by the scriptures. Now, this is why David said what he did in verses 6 through 8. He said that I stretch out my hand to you. My soul longs for you as a parched land. Answer me quickly, O Lord, my spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, or I will become like those who go down to the pit. Let me hear your loving kindness in the morning, for I trust in you. Teach me the way in which I should walk, for to you I lift up my soul. David speaks of how his nephesh, his soul, is distraught, and how his spirit fails 
due to the enemy coming against him. He seeks the Lord's help to overcome these feelings. In a similar manner, the weekly prayer outlines the same this way of making requests before God according to the Sidur Edot Mitzorah in the weekly Ivrit Amida. We read the following. And it says, Return, Lord, until when? And have counsel your servant. Gratify us in the morning with your kindness, and we will sing and rejoice all of our days. Let us rejoice like the days of our suffering. The year is bad. Show your servant your deeds and return it upon your chil their children. And may the grace of the Lord our God be upon us and the work of our hands guide for, guide for us and our handiwork guided. He who sits in the shelter of the Supreme One in the shadow of the Lord will he dwell. I say to the Lord, you are my refuge and my fortress, my Lord. I will trust in him for he will save you from the ensnared trap for the destructive pestilence. With his pinion he will cover you and under his wings you will be protected. Shield and armor are his truth. You shall fear from terror of night, nor from the arrow that flies by day, from pestilence that stalks in the dark, from a destroyer that ravages at noon. A thousand will encamp in camping at your left side and ten thousand by your right. To you they will not come near. Only with your eyes you shall peer, and the retribution of the wicked you shall see. Because you said, You, Lord, are my refuge. You made the supreme God your abode. No evil shall befall you, and a plague will not arrive to your tent. For his angel, he will command for you to protect you in all your ways. On palms they will carry you, lest you stub your foot on a stone. Upon a lion and a serpent you shall tread. You will trample a young lion and a snake. Because he, because he desired my name, I will protect him, and I will lift him, for he knows my name. He will call me, and I will answer him. I am with him in distress, and I will release him and honor him. I will satiate him with longevity of days, and I will demonstrate to him my salvation. Okay. So the prayer speaks of taking counsel in the Lord, searching his word, and trusting in his promises. The promises of God from the Torah and the Psalms reveals to us God's desire to save us from our enemies, from the snare, the trap, and from destruction. The Lord will empower us to overcome our enemies because he is our refuge, our shelter, our abode, and our and no evil will come upon us, nor will a plague come against us. The Lord knows us by name, and he comes to our rescue. And this is why David so longed for the presence of the Lord and desired to walk in God's ways, saying in Psalm 119, verse 33, Teach me, O Lord, the way of your laws. I will observe them to the utmost. Now, Rambam's Mishneh Torah on Repentance, chapter 6, part 4, it states the following. It says, Even on this very subject do the righteous and the prophets supplicate and pray that the Lord may help them to discover the truth. As David said, Teach me thy way, O Lord, that I may walk in thy truth. As it says, Let not my sins withhold the way of truth, by which I may discover thy way in the oneness of thy name. Likewise, this verse Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and let a free spirit uphold me, is as if saying, Grant leave to my spirit to do thy will, and let not my sins be accursed to withhold repentance from me, but let the power be in my hand until I will turn and understand and know the true way. And in such way, all other like verses are interpreted. Okay, so Rambam points out a characteristic of the righteous. They pray asking the Lord to help them to discover truth and to apply God's truth. You know, as he said, teach me thy way, right? David's truth leads to life. The exposition on the prayer of the righteous is as one who seeks the Lord to not hold his sins against him, to withhold the way of truth or to withhold repentance. And note how knowing the truth and repentance are both a product of God working in our lives. In fact, the righteous ask the Lord for power to be in our hand in order to understand and to know the truth. The reason being, it is the truth that sets us free. And it is in these things that David prays to God who has the truth. The reason being, oh, sorry, to God who has the absolute power and truth. To grant him courage and strength 
and to accomplish, accomplish his purpose and to lead him in the way of truth, to teach him the path of uprightness and to trust and wait upon him, just as he says in the Psalm 143, verse 8, Let me hear your loving kindness in the morning, for I trust in you. Teach me the way in which I should walk, for to you I lift up my soul. Now Solomon urges us here to tune into words of Torah and turn and to tune out to extraneous matters. Now, Rabbeinu Bahia on Deuteronomy 7, verse 12, he states the following. He says, he says, uh, when saying, guard them inside your heart, this refers not so much to the text of the commandments as to their essence. Something buried inside a person's heart and constantly guarded is not subject to being forgotten. And this is why we must guard Tor the Torah text as well as essence in our hearts so that we are not in danger of forgetting them. Now Solomon provides a reason why he considers this so essential, namely that Torah essence is equivalent to life itself. For all those who have once found them, the Torah, the text, and the commandments between them are healing for both the body and the soul. Now this is the importance of remembering the Lord, his promises and his ways. I think that um, Rabbeinu Bahia on Deuteronomy 7.12 uh, really kind of summarizes it really well. The rabbis speak of getting God's word into our hearts. Okay, And this is not just something about memorization. Okay, Because it says that um, you, we guard Torah as well as the essence in our hearts okay so it seems like there is something more to this that uh, Rabbeinu Bahia is speaking of that he calls the essence of the Torah that is in our hearts and this Word of God has the effect of changing us at a core level that is essential for the life of God's people this change occurs on the inside and is what Paul writes about as being a new creation. And this is what the rabbis say is the Torah essence, which is equivalent to life itself for all those who have found them. Now God's word and his ways are healing to both the body and the soul, just as David said in the Psalm 31 verse 20. It says, how abundant is the good that you have in store for those who fear you. That you do well, that you do in the full view of men for those who take refuge in you. Now, Psalm 143, it concludes and says in verses 9 through 12, it says, Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. I take refuge in you. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. For the sake of your name, O Lord, revive me. In your righteousness, bring my soul out of trouble. And in your loving kindness, cut off my enemies and destroy all those who afflict my soul. For I am your servant. Okay, so David speaks of the Lord working to the effect of his mercy, his chesed, you know, his grace, and his righteousness that saves to deliver us. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 20, it says, For the kingdom of God does not consist in words but in power. And when Paul wrote of the kingdom of God, he spoke of something more than just simple speech. Note what the rabbis say, that the power of God is so that we can recognize truth. And, and what, what was that truth? That we would repent and we would turn from our sins. That was um, what they said, what we read earlier. But... Paul, he also wrote that the kingdom of God is of something more than a simple speech, like um, David who sought the Lord to deliver him from his enemies. The kingdom of God is in power and being empowered by the Spirit of God to overcome sin. Now, I think that's why the, uh, the rabbis are looking at uh, the reason for asking for the power of God in our lives is to, is to repent, you know, so that he would help us to overcome sin. Now in Ephesians, Paul wrote, he said in Ephesians 5, verses 18 to 20, it says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody, melody to the Lord with your heart, 
giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now Paul is saying don't be intoxicated with alcohol, but be intoxicated with God, right? And his words confront each of us with the question of, are you intoxicated with God? I think that's a really good question. And what Paul is describing here is that our hearts are to be so overflowing, no matter what our circumstances, we are overflowing with thanks to God. David said in Psalm 143, verse 11, it says, For the sake of your name, O Lord, revive me. In your righteousness, bring my soul out of trouble. So one of the reasons David, who was so faithful to God, could be as successful at all that he did was because of his his um, faithfulness. For example, David was able to win all his battles because he trusted in God and he allowed him to be his guide. Paul wrote to the Romans, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. In Romans 8, verse 14, Paul says, The sons of God are led by the Holy Spirit of God in this life. David believed the same thing. He said in the Psalm 143, verse 10, it says, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. Okay? So each of us can be successful as David was and live a fulfilling life if we allow the Lord God Almighty and his Messiah to be our guide. And as David seeks for the Lord to guide him on level ground by God's spirit, why should we allow the Lord to direct our steps? You know? That's a question. Well, because we do not always do what is right, where our actions lead to sin. Jeremiah said it is not for them to direct their steps, in Jeremiah 10, 23, indicating that when left to our own, we seek to do our own thing and miserably fail. However, when we seek the direction of God in his Torah, we are always blessed. We experience less problems, less sadness, less headache, and more joy and peace coupled to God's blessings and approval. So that's that's all I had for my commentary on uh, Psalm 143. Let's pray and then um, I'll open the mic for anyone who has any comments. Heavenly Father, we Lord, we thank you for your mercy and the great work that you are doing in our lives. Lord, we believe that you are able to overcome all things from saving us from our enemies to the deliverance from sin, and even to work in our hearts to deeply, truly, and honestly seek you all the days of our lives. We recognize the weaknesses in our strength and resolve to serve you and to do what is expected, to be humble and to pray and to remain in your word. Lord, help us to do each one of these things. Help us to have the strength to stand for truth and life, to have the desire to seek you in prayer and in your word, and to have faith in Yeshua, your Messiah, and to love our neighbor each day. We thank you, Lord, for your continued faithfulness to your promises and to us. Help us to grow in our faith, to walk in the Spirit, and to apply these truths to our lives. We praise your holy name. We give you all the honor and the glory and the praise forever and ever. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so um, the, 